happy faces are gonna line the hallways. Those whose lives have been redeemed, the broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he set free. Little children and the aged and enhanced and all the glow of those who are crippled, broken, ruined, now clad in garments white as snow. The King is coming. The King is coming. Oh, I just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face I see for the king is coming the king is coming praise God he's coming for me oh I can hear the chariots rumble I can see the marching throng, the flurry of God's trumpet, spell the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding, heaven's grand stand all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled, start to sing.
Tonight, we're thankful for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary. We're thankful for the cross that Jesus carried to Golgotha. But tonight, we celebrate and we're thankful for the empty tomb. Because of that empty tomb, we have victory. We have victory over sin, over the old devil. But Jesus gained victory for us from the grave. And I'm thankful tonight that we celebrate that strength in Him. As we think about the cross, we think about Jesus' death on the cross. Reminded that that first Easter, until they recognized the resurrection, they were perplexed. The Bible talks about that. They were disillusioned and in despair. They were discouraged. Their hearts were broken. And yet they found hope. And tonight we find hope in the empty tomb. We're so thankful that you've joined us for the online service this Sunday Easter evening and it's going to be a wonderful service that's prepared for you for our church family we deeply love you and greatly miss you from the pastoral staff here to your home and it's going to be a great reunion when the Lord unites us together again here we're praying very soon and you pray with us that God would anoint this service as we've already sensed his power with us Father, we sure love you tonight. We thank you for your love and goodness to us. You're an amazing God. You're worthy of all our lives and, Lord, all that we have. And we give ourselves to thee. We consecrate this service to you. We ask, Lord, that you would move in in a very unique and special way. Speak to every heart. Anoint the preaching of your word. We thank you that we've already sensed your presence here in a special way. We ask you to continue to move. And, God, I pray that we would make decisions based on your word tonight. I pray, Father, that we would see souls saved and others drawn close to Thee. We thank You so much for the hope of the empty tomb. May we live for You in these days, and we'll give You the glory and the praise. For We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This is Jacqueline, Megan, and Daphne, and we are sisters, and that is why we are not standing six feet apart. Um, <laughs> that being said, we have prepared a second song for you, and we hope that it'll be a blessing to you. I've just come into a valley, one like I've never been before. I keep searching for a way out. Seems like padlocks are wrong, the doors, oh, there must be another sunrise, another sunset that I'll see. 
are sweet girls and we're thankful for them. They were born and grew up here at our church, the Wynn Sisters, and they're uh, the real deal and that's wonderful. We welcome you to church tonight and it's of course Easter. It's been a wonderful day. We've had uh, people respond to salvation this morning for that. I'm very encouraged and uh, tonight's service has been such a blessing as well. I appreciate the choir singing pre-recorded and the opener pre-recorded and that first song that we sang together. And Brother Martinez, the king is coming. You sort of sound it like you believe he's coming again. And I believe he's coming again. Let's pray for our country these days. Please pray for our president. You know, in a position like that, whoever you are, Republican or Democrat, who's ever in the office, whatever decision you make, half the crowd's gonna think you're great, the other half's gonna think you're a bum. And let's pray for our president. Let's show respect to the office. I've uh, voted for many presidents in my lifetime, and many times I didn't get what I voted for. But I always wanted to have respect toward the office and toward the man. And um, so I hope that you'll be sure to pray for our president. I understand he has some kind of announcement Tuesday. You might know more about that than I am. He's been talking to me every day, and we, I just had dinner at the White House today, Easter. It was wonderful. Well, maybe, I, I, I guess I'm lying in the pulpit, but nobody's here, so that's why I, I guess I think I'm going to get away with it, but I guess maybe someone might be watching that as God Almighty. And it's been a, a great day to think that God's people have been so encouraging to me and to my wife and all the text and the emails and the notes and the letters and uh, knowing that you miss church, that means so much to us and we miss you. I want to um, remind you about several things and one is we have um, Brother Martinez and Brother Galvan and myself at 9 o'clock. We're on live every day and I should know if it's on Facebook or I don't know what it is, but I guess they raised their hand up there and said that's what it is. And we love coming to you from our office. You, you want to listen tomorrow because you want to hear the song 
That, that man is going to sing and Brother Galvan is going to play. It is a great song. And uh, if for nothing else, I hope you'll hear that. It's about four or five minutes, the entire uh, brief uh, broadcast. So we look forward to that. And then I want to remind you on Wednesday night, the Pickin' and Grinning Boys, they'll be playing before the service. Service is at 6.30, and so they'll begin a, a little bit ahead of that. And uh, we're in for a great service, good music. Just It's going to be a great service Wednesday night, and they all have been. I appreciate all the people that put so much effort into this. Now let me talk to you about the offering. And as Pastor Cooper said this morning, I, I, I'm just so thankful for you. There's two areas I've asked you to consider, general fund and missions. This is our fifth Sunday. We've had five Wednesdays, five Sundays now out of church, a tenth of the year, a calendar year of 52 weeks. It's tough to look at it that way. But uh, I've asked you just to do your best to reach the budget, general emissions, and you have. We're averaging that we have reached it every week for five, four weeks. Now we'll see what today is. All of our businesses, all of our uh, people that are business people in our church are closed down. Our, uh, many of our people have lost their jobs. But in spite of that, you're reaching those two areas. I want the remaining folks that are listening, our members that have jobs, to know everything else is on hold. The uh, thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a month we put extra on the mortgage. We're not doing that right now, first time in about probably eight years. And uh, I hope that you'll understand that uh, we're going to have to make that up in time. The Christian school, the uh, elementary, the junior high, the high school, they're still in session but by remote. And uh, the same for the college. But those two institutions together by June 30th, which is the end of the fiscal year, I'm going to guess very easily will be three to 400,000 short. Somewhere that money has to show up. And maybe you could sustain these two great institutions. So I say all that, President's Club's on hold, student scholarships on hold, we're paying our bills, and, uh, but I want you to know that uh, though you're making the budget, general admissions, there's other areas as well. Please pray about it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get to the scripture, and uh, then we have the sweet echoes of joy. Uh, they're going to come sing for us tonight. And then the man of God, Brother Pastor Evangelist Justin Cooper, is going to preach. I'm excited to hear him. I feel like I may, I, no one's acted this way, but I don't want to wear out my welcome in this, this virus. I've been doing all the Sunday preaching morning and night, and prior to that, and prior to pastor's conference, most of it, and so it's time you have another voice, and um, I, I look forward to the message. Uh, Brother Cooper, Brother Atwood, and Brother Evertson all joined us, three great pastors last year. And all of us that are pastors, we agree that they have been such a breath of fresh air to us. And I know the men that are here and the staff that are here and the church has been a breath of fresh air to them. But I'm looking forward to preaching. Now, I'll be here amening, but I'm probably the only one amening, maybe one or two more that are in here. But at home, when he preaches something you agree with, you amen. And we'll listen for it tonight. So, Brother Ber Pastor Bertram, thank you for all you're doing. My, you're working so hard in the college these days and recording all your uh, education. And uh, I'm just so thankful for you. What a man of God. He'll read the scripture, and then um, we'll have the offering. And uh, it's online. They tell you how to give. Uh, and I hope that you'll give by mail or give right there what it says, N. VBC, that stands for North Valley Baptist Church, dot org slash give. And I hope that you'll be giving. Let's look to the scripture tonight and then the prayer for the offering, then the girls will sing. Tonight our reading comes from the book of Joshua, chapter number seven. Joshua, chapter number seven. Of course, the very familiar story of Achan and the defeat of this, the nation of Israel at the city of Ai. We're going to take up our reading in verse number 19 of Joshua chapter number 7. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, 
and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Our Heavenly Father, tonight we come before you and we are certainly grateful that though we are restricted from gathering together, we're not at all restricted from coming before your throne. Lord, tonight we need your help. I pray especially for the offering. I thank you for the people of North Valley Baptist Church and for their faithfulness and the sacrifice that they have made to sustain this work. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless them. I pray that you would provide every need as you've promised you would. And Lord, I pray that again this week, as the offering comes in electronically and through the mail and uh, people stop by and drop off their tithes and offerings, I pray that when all is said and done, that again we may be able to rejoice at what you have done through your people. And Lord, tonight I think of the preaching of the Word of God. As I sat there, I was reminded of that first Easter Sunday when some disciples were discouraged and disillusioned. And with downcast hearts, they made their way to a city called Emmaus. But all along the journey, somebody joined in. And on that Sunday, the living word took the written word. And by the spoken word, he changed their outlook. And the Bible says they looked at one another and said, did not our hearts burn within us? Oh, Lord, tonight, would you take the man of God, fill him with your power, And may he take the written word and by means of the spoken word talk to us about the living word and may our hearts burn as we fellowship with you this Easter Sunday. Now we pray that you would add your blessing to the rest of the service and we'll thank you for what you do for we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. The one Jesus raised. The religious were jealous and all the more zealous to stop all those giving him praise. But they soon discover the truth of God's power and that death was subject to Christ. No matter however, despite all their efforts, you can't kill what God's given life. Yes. 
to flee. Grave clothes are loose, the captive set free. No matter how long you've been in the grave, new life will come when he calls your name. Just know for sure he knows where you are, whatever the tomb, wherever the graveyard, no power can stop the hand of our God when Jesus speaks life, when Jesus speaks life. of joy and we are not sisters like the Nguyen's but we might as well be. We have one more song as well tonight and it's one of our favorites uh, because it's amazing to imagine being one of those who was at the empty tomb and then who got to tell everybody I've just seen Jesus.
make a difference, won't it? If you see Jesus, I tell you, everything is going to be all right. And I appreciate the good singing tonight. Thankful for all these ladies coming out. Thank you for singing. And I don't know about you, but I noticed at the beginning of the service, they showed these pre-recorded videos of our church congregational singing and things. And I don't know if I'm getting older. I don't know if it's because I have a, a little kid now, but I find myself getting more emotional. And I didn't used to be that way, but I saw that crowd. And I tell you, you don't realize what you have till it's gone sometimes. And uh, you saw that crowd there, and I can't wait till we can see it again. God's been good to us, hasn't he? Brother Bertram read the text, so I'm not going to go back and read it. But I, I have a few audiences I want to preach to tonight. I know because of the scope of the ministry that God's blessed here that one of those audiences will be our nation. And I, I want to preach to our nation. I want to preach to the churches scattered across our nation. Of course, more than that, I want to preach to our church and our church family. But I think most of all, I need to preach tonight to myself. If I were to ask you a question this evening and I were to ask you this, what poses the greatest risk or the greatest danger to our nation, what would your answer be? If I were to ask you what is the greatest threat at this moment to our nation, maybe you would say the COVID-19 because that's what everybody wants to talk about. Maybe you would say a terrorist attack because that's a very real threat. Maybe you would say uh, the... Uh, uh, the intrusion upon our election by foreign entities and those who mean to do us harm, and that could be it as well. Joshua came to a place where he asked God a question, Lord, why has this happened to our nation? What's caused this death, this defeat? What's brought this upon us? 36 men slain right after the victory in Jericho in a small place called Ai. Joshua goes so far as to even question whether or not they should have ever followed the will of God. He's distraught. He's discouraged. And God gives him the answer in verse number 11. He says this, here it is, Joshua, Israel hath sinned. But he narrows it down even further than that. And it wasn't the sin of the nation, but yet the sin of an individual that caused the ripple effect in the nation. And it gets whittled down to one man by the name of Achan. Achan did wrong, and acting as that domino to first fall, he knocked over a whole lot in Israel. His sin brought death to his nation. For a little while this evening, I want to preach a message that I pray God will use to speak to my heart, but also speak to yours. And I want to be kind of direct with the title, but you know it's because I, I love you and I care about you and I want God to meet with us. But here's the title. Your sin is killing our country. Not the liberals, not the crooked politicians, not what's happening out on Main Street. But I believe it's time for judgment to begin in the house of God. And I'm praying tonight God will help me and God will help you as we preach the Bible. Let's pray quickly. Lord, I pray for power to preach this message. And Lord, I want to, I guess, be entertaining, but more than that, I want to be effective. And God, I pray that you'd speak to the hearts of all those gathered around their televisions, their phones, wherever they might be. I pray that you'd reach through that device and grab a hold of our hearts tonight. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. I love America. And I don't blush at saying America is an exceptional nation. I believe this country has been and still is right now a nation divinely blessed by God. I love America. I love the statement made by John Winthrop when he quoted Jesus and said that we'll be a city upon a hill. And he desired that the early settlement in New England would be a model of Christian charity. I love America. I love our flag. I don't have use for a protester who would burn it, stomp on it, or disgrace it. I love the colors of red, white, and blue. I love the 13 stripes that stand for our 13 original colonies and the 50 stars that depict our 50 sovereign states. And though they be individual, thank God we stand together indivisibly united. I love America. I love our national anthem. I love the lyrics that describe our nation as being the land of the free and the home of the brave. I love our, our nation. I love the fact that our pledge declares us to be one nation under God. And even our money gives credence to the fact that we've placed our trust in Jehovah God, the God of the Bible. I love America. I love our traditions. I love our values. I love the American way of life. I love America. I love our founding fathers and the fact that they recognize that we have unalienable rights. And those rights weren't given to us by government, but those are our rights endowed by our Creator. 
I love America. I love to drive the country roads and see the landscape covered in churches. I love the fact that the American week slows down on Sunday. And whether they admit it or not, the nation's given credence to the fact that Sunday is still yet the Lord's day. I love America. I love our republic. I love the equal opportunity and the equal voice that our form of government offers its citizens. I love our monuments. I said this in a message a few weeks ago. I love the fact that on those monuments you can find scripture references. The Supreme Court justices still to this day sit below a display of the Ten Commandments that hangs on the wall above their heads. I love America. I love our military. I love every branch. I love the sacrifice and the courage that millions of men and women have shown to keep us free. Blood has been shed in jungles, upon sandy beaches, in muddy trenches, and in dense forests for the cause of liberty and national security. I love America. I love the innovators and the great minds that have made society-changing contributions to our world. It was an American that gave the world the telephone. It was an American that provided the world with the assembly line. It was an American who gave us the steamboat. Americans have propelled the progress of humanity. I love this country. This is where I was born. This is where I choose to live. This is where I'm raising my family. This is where we serve the Lord. I'm not looking for an alternative, and I don't have any aspirations to move to Canada. This is my country. This is my nation. I love America. I love the liberty that we enjoy. No other nation in this world provides its citizens with the freedoms that we have in America. Our country is a country that regardless of your race, your religion, your ethnicity, your IQ, your educational level, we all have equal standing and equal opportunity in our nation. I love our culture. I love the fact that our culture is the best of every culture. I don't know about you, but I like tacos. Say amen right there. And they all come together and meet in this great melting pot and make us America. I love America. I love the ingredients that have made America, and I believe that would be patriotism and work ethic and perseverance and bravery. I love our nation. I love the fact that still yet, the man who holds the highest office in our land places his hand on this book right here as he takes his oath of office. I love America. I love our nation. We've been the aid of those in turmoil. We've provided help to those hurting around the world. America's been a moral agent. And it's just the truth of the matter that when America leads, the world has been a better place. Patrick Henry, one of our founding fathers, said it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists but by Christians. Not on religions but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And can I say that our nation has been and is yet still today a blessed nation because we've been a nation founded upon the truths of the word of God. We've been guided by grace and protected by prayer. And I believe America has been blessed because America has heeded the preaching of the Word of God. I love America. But let me quickly say this tonight. I fear for America. I'm afraid for my nation. In fact, I wonder how much longer we'll even have a country like the one I've tried to describe tonight. It seems like a darkness hovers over our heads and uncertainty clouds the future. It's a sad day when you have to think twice before you speak truth in public. Nowadays, you go to the grocery store and you might be at risk at being either at the center of a mass shooting or contracting some kind of terrible disease. I'm not trying to be morbid, but I've got to be honest with you. Every time I get on an airplane, I either think this, what disease am I going to get this time or is there going to be a terrorist attack? I fear for our nation. We're encouraged to abstain from shaking hands, but we're encouraging abortions. Why in the world is the church house closed but Planned Parenthood is open for business? AOC, they call her, said this, America has not earned the right to call itself a humane society. And I guess I would agree with her if she's speaking about the fact that we keep the butcher shops for babies open and we close the doors to the house of God. Even today, a reporter said, as I watched the news, they, they said it's time for churches to get used to going to virtual services. Can I say that I'm not wanting to and I'm not willing to get used to going to virtual services? 
The governor in Kansas made the statement, our response to this unprecedented pandemic has necessitated that even our most fundamental institutions, talking about the local church, find an alternative method that would preserve public health. Can I say there is no alternative method when it comes to the word of God. The Bible says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together in our own state. In San Bernardino County, they tried to go to services online only, and this happened right on the cusp of Easter, and thank God that got overturned. The mayor in Louisville, Kentucky, tried to criminalize Easter services and said on his Twitter feed, we cannot have in-person services of any kind, of any faith, this week, and that includes drive-in services. Now, I'm glad that got overturned, but can I say that would set a very dangerous precedent here in America, and it's a sad day, and I fear for my nation. I fear for a nation that's been founded upon the Bible now wants to censor preachers of the Bible. I fear for a nation that's been protected by prayer and now tells us you can't pray in the name above every name in some public places. I fear for a nation whose founders were clear our country was created on Christian values and now some would try to convince us the church can have no say-so over the state whatsoever. I fear for our economy. I fear that something so large as the American economy might shut down quickly, but it's going to start up slowly. It might be easy to close it down, but it might be hard to start it back up. I fear that we spend money that we don't have, and we have a lack of industry and a lack of American-made products. I fear for a bill that our great-great-great-grandchildren are going to have to pay because you and I had to have a stimulus check to make it through a virus. I fear for our citizens. It's unsettling to me that our government would label anybody, whether they work or not, as being unessential. I fear for our readiness to muzzle liberty due to panic and uncertainty. I believe caution is commendable, but can I say overreach is very hard to undo. Can I ask a question? Why in the world, in the state of Michigan, would they say that for now, we're not going to let you uh, buy seeds and have a garden at your house? How does that make any sense whatsoever? I trust our president, but I am a little bit leery of some other voices in high places that are saying this might set a a new precedent for how we govern our states. On the streets of America, people look like bank robbers with their faces hidden behind masks and their gloves hidden, or their hands hidden under gloves. And that's because the local authorities have threatened that if you don't, then they might give you a citation. I read an article where a man on a bus in Pennsylvania was ripped off of the bus because he didn't have a mask covering his face, and they're trying to tell us this is the new normal. It seems to me that our civic leaders are about as messed up on the definition of liberty as some of our faith leaders. Our founding fathers said it like this, give me liberty or give me death. But I fear my generation has been quick to hand over liberties at the threat of just getting sick. Now, I'm not trying to downplay our situation. I've got dear friends who've contracted this virus, and we know folks that are in the hospital. I am not downplaying the severity, but I am concerned about the long-term ramifications that if Jesus doesn't come, what's church going to look like a generation from now? I'm concerned over a World Health Organization that polices the globe from behind a conference desk and threatens to intrude upon homes and separate families. They readily take our money, but they don't want our questioning or any accountability. I fear for an America where we would give unelected officials more power than our elected president has. I fear for our society that would deem liquor stores as absolutely necessary, but church houses as luxuries. Are you trying to tell me that Bud Light is more important to our country than the gospel light? It bothers me to see police lights flashing in the parking lot of churches because some folks wanted to go and see fellow believers and hear their preacher preach and sing the hymns in the safe confines of their own car. I'm bothered that citations are given to those who drive their cars to church while actual criminals are getting slaps on the wrist and pardon sentences. What kind of a country makes an outlaw out of a churchgoer and a free man out of an outlaw? I just drove here and I talked to pastor before I preached. I guess the parks and the sidewalks missed the memo that the church got because I had to drive about five miles an hour to get out of my neighborhood lest I run over family after family after family throwing frisbees and walking dogs and fellowshipping with their neighbors. It's a scary thing 
that some political figures call our Constitution fluid, our flag offensive, and patriotism xenophobic. I watched over a month ago as the Speaker of the House with a premeditated intent took and ripped up a State of the Union address that was 100% pro-American and positive about the condition of our country. I fear for our nation. It bothers me to see rioting in our streets against our law enforcement officers and it bothers me that some would call us Islamic phobic and they want to appease those that would do us harm rather than protect the citizens of our nation. It bothers me the traditional old-fashioned American pride bothers so many people who say they're also Americans. It's okay to have pride in perversity and pride in your football team and pride in your paycheck, but woe unto that man or woman that boasts of pride in their nation or pride in God. It's a sad day when a criminal of war has more rights on the battlefield than a baby in the womb of its own mother. I fear for politically correct America that throws out common sense and historical position to kowtow to perverts and fringe radical groups. I fear for an America that's kept in a frenzy by a mainstream media that peddles in misinformation and half-truth. We're constantly bombarded by spin over facts and drama over truth and every story always casts in an anti- American leaning shade. I fear for an America that tries to do away with the mention of Jesus and would allow an atheist group from a distant state to come to a small town and sue them over their manger scene at Christmas time or their monument to the Ten Commandments. It was James Madison, the fourth president of our nation, the father of the Constitution that said we have staked the whole of our political institution upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. I fear for an America that would call a man wearing a dress a hero and then cheer the imprisoning of a Christian who tried to stand for their First Amendment rights. An individual can switch their clothing, but they can't change their chromosomes. And can I say God makes no mistakes, and that might be above and beyond some of the professors that are public institution, but that's just simple, good old-fashioned common sense to the rest of us. I fear for a racially divided America and a political class that wants to profit from that division. I fear for a far left-leaning America that believes climate change, or here's a new one, environmental racism is a bigger threat than some kind of a madman that would want to destroy America. I fear for an America that needs a prescription pill to get through a day and a shot of liquor to make it through the hour. I fear for an America where purity is called ridiculous and modesty is made fun of. I fear our, our heroes are professional athletes and pop singers and sitcom stars known for fornication and cursing and mocking the God of heaven. I fear for an America that romanticizes and flirts with socialism and Marxism. Winston Churchill said socialism is the equal distribution of misery. I fear for an America where the home is devalued and marriage is a passe practice. I fear for our younger generation that pays too much money to sit at the feet of a liberal, a socialist, or an atheist in a public college and they'll either have to pay off that debt till they're dead or they'll raise our taxes and let us pay off that debt. Now, I want to say all that to say this. I believe this is the greatest country on the face of the planet. And I love America, but America is spiritually sick. In some ways, I believe America is spiritually failing. Maybe we could even get, maybe it's too extreme, maybe not. Maybe she's even spiritually dying. Can I, she's on life support. Can I say tonight, I don't have the luxury to preach to the House of Representatives. And I don't have the privilege to preach to the Senate, though if they would ask me, I would fly there tomorrow with a face mask. I don't have the luxury to preach to the crowd out there. But can I say this message is not for them. Because can I say revival is not contingent upon the condition of a lost society. Revival is not contingent upon the condition of a crooked politician. Revival is not contingent upon the condition of a wayward world. Revival is contingent upon the house of God and the people of God. And far too long, for far too, it's been far too easy to point a finger in the direction opposite of self and to look at the trash in everybody else's yard and ignore what might be piled up in our own. And I'm here to say tonight, it is not their sin. It is not that crime. 
crowd over there. But America is sick tonight because God's people are not getting right with God. It's my sin. I've got to get right with God. Like the Bible says, let judgment begin at the house of God. I wish every atheist would get saved. I wish every liberal would get right. I wish every terrorist was either converted, captured, or killed. But can I say none of that has to happen for us to see revival. You and I, it starts with us. The Bible said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Our nation's in trouble tonight. Our nation needs a restoration. Our nation needs awakened. Our nation needs revival. But it won't happen until God's people in your living room, in your car, wherever you find yourself tonight, are willing to open up our hearts to the Holy Spirit of God and say, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and get back on the altar, back in sackcloth and ashes. God, send revival. It's my sin. It's your sin. I don't have time, so let me just hurry this up. I had 30 minutes of introduction and 10 minutes of sermon. Jericho's just fallen. The dust from those giant walls has not even settled back to earth. Jericho was key in possessing the promised land, a fortified city, a powerful city. Joshua, at the order of God, had compassed the city for six days silently. On the seventh day, they went around the city seven times, shouted with a great shout. The walls came tumbling down. Only Rahab the harlot was spared. All the silver, the gold, the brass, all the precious things at the command of God were to be taken to the treasury of the Lord. Now, can you imagine the shouts in the camp of Israel? God brought the walls down. God did what only God can do. We're on the winning side. Ai was just east of Bethel. It was the next city standing between Israel and the promises of God. It wasn't a fortified city. It was a small city. In fact, the Bible says in verse number 3, they are but few. Joshua rounds up about 3,000 men. 3,000 men who'd just been conquerors. 3,000 men who'd just been champions. 3,000 men who'd just been on the winning side. And they begin their march toward AI victory, a sure thing. But the Bible tells us that quickly 36 of those hardened practice, I mean seasoned soldiers are slain on the battlefield. How did this happen? They go from marching towards Zion to retreating back from whence they'd come. They'd been conquerors and now they've been overcome and the Bible says it's so discouraging to the people of God that their hearts began to melt within them. They couldn't understand. Their hearts were as water and they cry out why? What brought this on us? How do we go from winning to losing? How do we go from conquerors to being conquered? How do we go from marching Marching forward to running backward. How did this happen? Joshua, as though he's at his own funeral, he rents his garments and covers himself in dust and mourns and says, God, I wish we wouldn't even have followed you now. I wish we never to cross Jordan. It'd been better off that we stayed on the other side. Why did this happen to us? And he began to blame God for the situation and blame others for what happened. And God answers and said, Here it is, Joshua. I tell you why. You've gone from winning to losing. I tell you why. You've gone from the top to the bottom. I tell you why. You've gone from conquerors to being overcome. Israel hath sinned. He tells him how to discover just who it was and he whittles it down. That's good West Virginia language. He narrows it down. He takes the tribe of Judah, separates them from the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, he takes the family of the Zerites from the tribe of Judah. From the family of the Zerites, he takes out the family of Zabdi from the Zerites. And then finally, there's Achan standing there with his knees knocking together. His heart beating out of his breast. Sweat beating down his brow. As God, in essence, took his finger, stuck it on the snout of Achan. And said, that's the reason your country's experienced this death. Achan sinned. 
Joshua acts as the chief prosecutor and he gets Achan to confess to his wrongdoing. And Achan answers in verse number 20 and 21 that Brother Bertram read. He said, and Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned. Look at the honesty. I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. And then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they're hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Here's what Achan did. Achan and thought, you know, I know what God said, but this isn't going to hurt anybody but me. It won't affect anybody but me. It's just a little thing. Achan didn't understand the ripple effect that him not being right with God would have on his entire nation. And Achan touched that, which he wasn't supposed to touch. And he took that, which he ought not take. And he looked at what he wasn't supposed to look at. And when he did, it brought death to his nation. Women were widows. Children lost their daddies. Men lost their friends. Why? Because Achan had sinned. And now listen, I'm preaching to you. And God knows I don't want to preach. I don't like to preach like this. No preacher wants to preach like this. But I have to tell you that none of us can live to ourselves or die to ourselves. And every one of us, when we sin, it's like a stone cast into a lake. And we send ripples out in every direction. And one man not right with God can affect a family. And one man not right with God can affect a church. And one church not on fire for God can affect a nation. Listen tonight, if we're going to have revival... We've got to quit looking everywhere else. It's easy to cast blame at Washington. It's easy to get down on the public school. It's easy to blame somebody that doesn't sit in a padded pew. But for you and I tonight, it's us. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of revival. Spike Lee, you know who that is. If you do, you're probably watching the wrong kind of movies. But anyway, Spike Lee made this statement. He said, people might think I'm crazy, but I think the earth is mad at us over what's going on right now. I do think he's crazy. But I also think he has the same attitude that a lot of Christians have. Did you ever stop to consider that just maybe God is trying to get our attention? Tornadoes in the south. Earthquakes in diverse places. Volcano eruptions in other countries. A virus ravaging the world. Have you ever stopped to consider maybe God is true to his word. And God will do what he has to do to bring a nation to its knees so that they look back and call out to him. Let me give you quickly, I'm not going to preach them because I don't have time. Just let me mention these three aspects of Achan's sin. Number one, it was simply this. Achan's sin was disobedience to God. You can go back tonight and read it with your family. But in Joshua chapter number six, he got the clear command. Don't take anything. Don't touch anything. It all goes to the treasury of the Lord. Now, God didn't stutter when he told Joshua. Joshua didn't stammer and stutter whenever he told Israel. So that tells me that Achan knew exactly what God expected. But Achan willingly, knowingly acted in disobedience to the clear command of God. The Bible said in James 4, 7, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is Sin. First Samuel 15, 22, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Achan's a sinner, but listen, he's not on a bar stool. He's not in a jail cell. He hasn't murdered anybody with his own hands. He's not committing adultery. You say, what's his sin? Simply not obeying God. Obedience is not a principle that has gray area room in it. Obedience is this, immediate compliance with a given command. It's to do right, the right way, right on time, every time. God said it, and that settles it whether I agree with it or not. You say, I know what's killing America, the booze crowd, the drug crowd, the abortion crowd, the liberal crowd. No, here it is. It's Christians that know God says to tithe and they won't give. God says be a witness and they don't soul win. God says pray without ceasing and they don't pray. Study to show that self approved and they don't read their Bible. It's easy to blame others but can I say, ask yourself, have I been disobedient to God? Number two, it was a sin of distraction. Verse number 20, and I, this is probably the entire message should have just been preached on this because right now it's so easy to be distracted. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Watch what he said in verse 21. When I saw. Now, don't you think Achan was shouting victory in Jesus with the rest of them just a minute ago? He'd been used by God. Man, he knew what it was to have the hand of God on his life. He was on fire for God. He loved God. I haven't seen him going through the rubble there. I mean, can you imagine the rubble of Jericho? They're going through it, and Achan's testifying. God brought those walls down. God kept his promise. We marched, and God came through. God is so good. 
looks like some silver. That looks like gold. Oh, I'd look good in that shirt. I want to say, wait a minute, Aiken, don't you remember how much you used to love God? Don't you remember how much you used to serve God? Don't you remember how faithful you were just a minute ago to God? Don't get your eyes off of him onto something else. But that's what, he got distracted and he brought death to his nation. Can I say, it is Christians with their head on a constant swivel that can't keep their eyes on the Lord and stay in the will of God that are destroying our nation. Revelation 2, 4, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love I love new converts I guess if, if, if preachers could pa pa pick who they pastor they might vote for new converts because you don't have to pep them up you got to calm them down and I'd much rather have to calm you down than resurrect you new converts are excited when I first got saved nobody had to ask me to go soul winning I bugged the preacher are we going soul winning I went to everything Wednesday night Sunday morning Sunday night ladies Bible study I didn't care I wanted to be in church a new convert has a new Christian life. A new convert has a new prayer life. A new convert has a new Bible study life. A new convert has a new serving God life. A new convert has a new church, a new pastor, new songs, new people, and it's a honeymoon all the way around, and they're on fire for God. There's a blessing with being a new convert, but there's a danger to being an old convert because your prayer life isn't as new. And your Bible study is not as new. And the church is not new. And the preacher is not new. You've heard the illustrations. We've sung the hymns. You've gone through the big days. And if we're not careful, the excitement, the thrill is gone, if you will. And we get our eyes off of that which we used to love and used to be all in on and used to be excited about onto a lesser thing, to be distracted, to let something arrest your attention. Here it is. You say, I don't agree with that. I don't think we're distracted. Then let me ask you this. On a normal day in America when we're not quarantined, why is it that you have a church with hundreds of people and 10 go soul winning? Why is it that you might have a thousand on Sunday morning and 500 somewhere on prayer Wednesday night? Why is it you have hundreds of men and you have 40 show up for Saturday night men's prayer? I tell you what's killing America, it's used to's. It's once dids. It's people with yellow testimonies and moth-eaten memories of how they used to love God and live for God and serve God. I preach in places, I, we used to have a choir like that. We used to preach like you. We used to have this, that, and the other. I'm preaching to somebody tonight, you used to love this church. You still come, but you used to love it. You used to shout that preacher on. There was no preacher like that preacher. Oh, that's my preacher. But now you just sit there watching your phone. Can't wait till it's over. You used to sing in the choir. I want to be in that choir. That means I got to go to choir practice. You used to be faithful to Sunday school. I know now that we're all stuck indoors. We'd say, I'd give anything to go. Hey, but it won't be long before we get back to normal. A bunch of used to's. Distracted. Number three, and I'll be, I'll be through. Achan's sin was a sin of disobedience, a sin of distraction. And then lastly, and this is what keeps us from having God work, a sin of dishonesty. He took it, and read verse 21, and behold, they are hid, he said, in the earth. I don't know how long it was from Jericho's fall to Ai's defeat. I don't know. All I know is this, for however long it was, Achan lived like he was right, knowing that he wasn't. He went about his day. The death would have kept happening. The defeat would have kept happening. And he would have acted like he was just as right with God as anybody else. All the while he had something stowed away in his tent. I believe the reason that we don't see God move like we read about God moving is because when God dials our number, we fail to pick it up and answer when he speaks. I don't know about you, but I'm probably the most backslidden member of this church because every time I come, God convicts me about something. He might preach on something I don't even have anything to do with about being a good grandparent. I think, God, I'm not being the right kind of grandparent. You know what I mean? It's the Holy Spirit of God. Every time the Bible's open, the songs even, it just, it challenges, it, it, it convicts. In every service, I find myself having to get right with God, whether I get on an altar or I'm standing up here in front of you in my heart, humbling and getting right with God. The Bible said, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. And I wonder tonight what you already know that I don't even have to name or preach on that you have hidden in the tent of your heart 
that's keeping your family from being blessed or your personal life from having revival or your church from being as blessed as it could. If there's bitterness in your tent, get it out. If there's gossip in the tent, get it out. If there's envy in the tent, get it out. If there's a lack of love for lost souls, get it out. If you've not picked up your Bible during this time of quarantine, it's time to get that out. Your prayer life is not fervent. Hey, revive it. Get that out. Oswald Chambers made the statement. It's such a powerful statement. He said, it's perilously easy to have amazing sympathy to God's truth and yet remain in sin. Did you hear what I said? It's easy to come to church and shout amen and say, well, that's good right there and still not really get right with God. Tonight, my prayer is my audience was America. That was the first part of the message. The churches across America, our church, but most of all to myself because I can't control the rest of those. But I can control what happens inside of my heart. And if there's any wicked way in me, I tell you, if I have any hope of revival, I've got to get it right. Abraham Lincoln made this statement. He said, if our nation will be destroyed, it will not come from without. It will be because we destroy ourselves. And can I say, if our church goes the wrong direction, if we don't see the hand of God and the blessings of God, it won't be because God has become uninterested in us. It will be because we've refused to get right with Him. What's going to die if you don't get right tonight? Your marriage? Your walk with God? I'm going to pray. The altar will be open. Brother Galvan's going to play on the piano. Listen, at home, would you pray right now? Very serious invitation. Pray with your family. Pray for your nation, but don't, don't do that at first. Pray for self first. Draw a circle around self and get self right. And by the way, I don't believe you're just going to get right in one prayer, bowing down. And it's going to take work. Lord, I pray that you'd please speak to hearts at home right now. Lord, many people are watching that I don't know, but those who are watching that we do know, Lord, I love them, and I know our pastor loves them, and I know the staff loves them. And God, we never preach to hurt, but we want to preach to be a help. And God, I need that tonight. Oh God, I'm so discouraged by what happens out in the streets of our nation. But I can't control that. I've got to leave that up to you. I pray tonight you'd help us all to do thorough business with you personally tonight. Speak to hearts. I pray every father listening will get right with God. And I pray he'd lead his family to be right with God. I pray every mother would get right with God and lead her children to get right with God and be right with God. I pray for every husband and wife, God, that they would endeavor to be right with you. I pray for our church folks, Lord. Every pew in this place, you can see people in your mind where they used to sit and usually sit, but they're not here. I pray for every person that fills these pews on a normal Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday. That they're watching now, I pray that they'd endeavor to get right with you, that they might have revival. We complain and curse the darkness, but maybe God's trying to get our attention. Lord, I pray you'd help us to think on that. Thank you for the Bible in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Brother Caleb, you can stop playing. I appreciate you putting up with me preaching. I know you wanted to hear Pastor preach. I just pray God will send revival in these days. Let's not waste it. Let's ask God to work. We'll be back, of course, in the morning at 9 o'clock. Facebook update, church, tune in for that. On Wednesday night, we'll be here 6.30 with a great service. Looking forward to it. Have a great week. Let us know if you need anything. God bless you. Have a great evening. God's given up even when I'm tested and tried. I'll not waste time attacking.